Thank you, sir. So as we all know, all know today's speaker is Dr. B. Vijay Kumar, officer in charge, environmental uh, survey lab, Kudamkulam Nuclear Power Projects. Dr. K.S. Maya, former principal, Government College, Triponatra, will introduce the speaker. Over to you, ma'am. Dr. Maya, please unmute. Unmute, unmute first. Yes, okay. Good evening, all of you. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. B. Vijay Kumar, who is going to talk on the subject nuclear power for clean, green, and sustainable energy security. This subject is very relevant in the present scenario of increasing demand of energy, and Sri B. Vijay Kumar is the apt person to talk on this subject. About Sri B. Vijay Kumar. He is a postgraduate in chemistry and has 28 years of experience in environmental radiological surveillance around nuclear power plants, nuclear counting techniques, techniques of radiation detection and measurements, etc. He has been instrumental in the setup of environmental survey laboratory at Kodamkulam and has carried out pre-operational environmental radiological studies around Kodamkulam site. Presently, he is your officer in charge of environmental survey laboratory at Kodamkula. He has many achievements in his career. He was the principal collaborator of many projects and was one of the national team member of International Atomic Energy Agency coordinated research projects. He is a life member of the Institution of Chemists India and Indian Society of Analytical Scientists. About his research activities, he has published a number of papers in national and international journals. On behalf of all the participants and on behalf of all the members of ISAS, I heartily welcome you, sir, to deliver the talk. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, respected uh, uh, chief guest today, Dr. Malodra, sir. The webinar uh, committee chairman, Dr. Nair, the program coordinator, uh, Joseph, sir, national president, uh, ESAS, uh, Dr. P.P. Chandrachodan, sir. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here today as the last man, the 12th man of the uh, series. But nevertheless, uh, it will be on a very important uh, subject. Uh, it's a good opportunity to uh, share my views on the nuclear power sustainability goals and also the other issues concerning the nuclear sector and it's also i'm also a bit nervous because uh, i am addressing a galaxy of uh, scientists retired scientists and uh, really great scientists i'm sure dr malotra sir must have handled uh, this at the height of uh, kudangalam impose he himself must have handled a uh, very tough uh, uh, public uh, hostile uh, uh, behaviors and all that so it's a very challenging uh, uh, area Anyway, I uh, hope I will be able to make a, a good presentation today. And mostly it is uh, targeted towards uh, non-DAE uh, uh, audience because uh, there is nothing new for our uh, DAE scientists. Everything, whatever, whatever I'm going to present, everything is known to them. So there is nothing new to offer. Whereas for the non-DAE audience, there will be some insight from this presentation. Okay, thank you. Light is visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so today's uh, talk uh, will be on uh, nuclear power for clean, green, and uh, sustainable energy security. The, the concept of atom is indeed uh, very old. It dates back to 6th century BC. The father of the atom, however, the Greek philosopher Democritus, who along with his master, Leucippus, defined the atom as the smallest element of matter, around 450 BC. Only in the 20th century beginning, physicists like Ernest Rutherford began to unravel the mysteries of the internal structure of the atom. Later, the famous uh, Einstein's mass energy relationship demonstrated the huge amount of energy which is locked up in the nucleus. Later, Fermi showed how this energy can be harnessed and exploited, which can be beneficial to the humankind at large. 
now this is the 60 years of uh, nuclear energy story we have had some contrasting statements coming from lord ernest rutherford in 1933 the energy produced by breaking down the atom is a very poor kind of thing anyone who expects a source of power from the transformations of this atom is talking moonshine this is the statement which we had in 1933 whereas in 1954 the chairman us atomic energy commission remarked it is not too much to expect that our children will enjoy in their homes nuclear generated electrical energy too cheap to meet up now in 2020 66 years of the electricity was first produced by nuclear power and delivered to the grid we know the truth lies somewhere towards the right extreme now this is the timeline we can see for the nuclear power the first civilian uh, reactor to send nuclear electricity to the grid was in obinisk ussr 1954 and we have had different timelines the 100 gigawatt mark was breached before 1980 then we reached in the mid 80s 200 gigawatt just before 1990 300 gigawatts uh, electricity nuclear electricity was breached and today we produce around 392 gigawatt of electricity through nuclear power and we have had our own reactors at tarapur 1 and 2 in the year 1969 and from there we have progressed to uh, kudangulam and uh, recently we had a 700 megawatt phwr uh, uh, reactor going stream in kakrapa the total numbers of uh, reactors which are in operation today is uh, 442 producing around 392 gigawatt electrical energy and the reactors under construction are 53 numbers accounting for some 56 gigawatt electrical energy most of them in china and uh, if you also see the type of reactors that are operating as well as that are being constructed you will see that the type which we have in kudangulam bver is the majority type you can see some 64 percentage of bvrs are operating the world over also some 84 percentage of bvrs are under construction similarly the pswrs which is the main stay of india is operating around 11 percentage of the reactors are about are phwr type which is the main stay of india the growth of install capacity in if you see from 1950s just after independence we just had 2 gigawatt electrical capacity and then we progressed to 223 in the year 2013 and today it's around 372 gigawatt electrical capacity install capacity and world and india energy scenario if you look at still we have a long way to go because the uh, per capita electricity consumption is ar around 1100 let us say it's around 1100 whereas the advanced countries like usa japan are almost you know uh, they, they have crossed 13000 usa and uh, japan has crossed around 8000 whereas the world average is around 3000 gigawatt uh, kilowatt hour per capita this slide was shown in the last week's uh, presentation also by dr grower sir the human development and per capita consumption they are very closely related and this human development index is a comparative measure of life expectancy literacy education and standards of living the countries fall into four broad categories based on their human development index very high high medium and low and 4000 kilowatt hour per person per year is the dividing line between the developed and developing countries and here india is in the lower extreme so we have much more to produce and we have to scale up our install capacities and also the per capita electricity availability to a person if you see the indian electricity mix the half, more than half plate is still being supplied by the thermal composed of coal gas and diesels the renewables are accounting around 20 percentage hydro is around 14 percentage and nuclear electricity 6780 megawatt is from uh, nuclear electricity and is accounting under 2 percentage only right now and future forecast as per the integrated energy policy projection for the next 25 years to meet 7 to 9 percentage of uh, gdp growth projects that nuclear has to be increased to around 10 percentage to realize the total install capacity of around 700 gigawatt by year, year 2035 or so and this is the inconsistency of a renewable uh, source because that malhotra sahab was uh, mentioning 
sometime uh, back in his inaugural address about the inconsistency or maybe the comparison between the nuclear and the renewables. This is the problem with the renewable. One of the problem is, uh, is the inconsistency of the power generation. We can see here during the southwest monsoon when the wind speed is quite comfortable, we have a good generation from April to October. This is for one particular year we have put it here. The 2015-16 financial year we have put and the rest of India as well as Tamil Nadu. Here we can see the peak is good during the southwest monsoon time when the wind profile or the wind is comfortably good. But then it tapers towards the other six months. So we don't produce the power perennially throughout the year. This is the nuclear energy competitiveness. Cost-wise, if you compare the nuclear energy electricity, the cost is very competitive and nuclear electricity from Tarapur, still it is under one rupee and Kudangulam electricity is under four rupees. It's quite competitive compared to other sources of electricity generation. And this is the scorecard we have. Air pollution was responsible for some 3.2 million deaths in 2010 and 3.5 million deaths in the year 2013. And most polluted cities were in China and India where most frequently people have to use masks much before the onslaught of corona. People had to use uh, masks in polluted cities, both in uh, China as well as in India. Here we can see the students wearing face masks walking across the street in a line in Jinan, in East China's Shandong province among, amongst heavy air pollution. For any energy to be exploited to the, for the benefit of the human kind and for the benefit of the mankind, we have to balance three E's. One is the energy, the other one is the economics, the third one is the environment. The energy has to be a good source, a sustainable source, and it has to be viable, should be economically feasible, and it should not be hazardous to the environment. These three E's have to be properly balanced for any energy to be economically and environmentally possible. And this is the another one which is staring at us, the climate change issues. The climate system of the Earth atmosphere is constantly changing. Global mean surface temperatures are rising and change in rainfall patterns. Oceans are warming up. Sea levels are rising. Features of extreme weather and climate events are changing. 50 to 85 percentage reduction in greenhouse gases is required by 2050. These are forecasts of climate change. We can have the increased water stress, droughts, heat waves, floods, less agricultural productivity, damage to ecosystems, 30 percentage of terrestrial species facing growing risk of extinction, coral bleachings in oceans, damage from floods and storms, human health increased morbidity, mortality, all these things are forecasts of the climate change, which if left unattended, we will have all these problems. The global energy challenge, we have the energy, which is very central to the development, which is required to alleviate poverty, improving human welfare, rising living standards. Energy is a precondition for all other investments, manufacturing, industry, healthcare, human capital, gender equity and social equity and 2.6 billion people rely on traditional biomass as their primary source of energy, then 1.3 billion people do not have still access to electricity. This is a very famous uh, thing which we all know, the greenhouse effect, the more and more fossil fuels are used, more and more uh, carbon dioxide and other gases will be there in the atmosphere and they will trap uh, the outgoing solar radiation and they will re-emit the uh, heat and long wave emission of long wave infrared radiation back to the atmosphere takes place. So this leads to the warming of the earth. Also the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere has steadily increased and it has now touched more than 400 and the ocean pH has steadily dropped and it is now becoming almost close to 8, 8.05. And if we compare the world CO2 emissions by sector, we can see heat, electricity, and transport account for two thirds of the total global emissions. So this still it is the, the case. And carbon dioxide is produced while burning coal, wood, diesel, and oil. 
now a one unit of electricity generated using nuclear it produces no carbon dioxide at all unlike coal oil and gas where we are left with some carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and climate change is no longer a distant threat and that is the prediction is an overarching environmental problem of our times nuclear power needs to be part of the solution to combat this type of issues which is looming large this is another attractive feature which we can say for the nuclear power the fuel consumption is the least of all the type of uh, electricity generation source for a 1000 megawatt uh, plant with 60 75 percentage uh, annual uh, utilization we can say oxygen consumption carbon dioxide emission last column you can see sulfur dioxide nitrogen oxides dust ash everything is zero and that fuel requirement is also one of the least for the nuclear power plant so uh, the nuclear power plants do not release any harmful gases and they do not release any particulates they help protect the ozone layer and they help reduce the global warming preserves the air quality and keeps our environment clean and green so they can be built very close to the area where we need to uh, have the electricity unlike hydro otherwise uh, long transmission lines will be required so this will help cutting down the transmission losses this is another advantage we can have and nuclear is a clean air solution for our power generation the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions intensity of the electricity generation methods if we compare for different types the nuclear ranks among the lowest along with wind and hydroelectric this is the life cycle life cycle greenhouse gas emissions that is suppose if you start the full cycle like from start starting from mining milling fabrication operation uh, reprocessing waste management everything put together nuclear ranks amongst one of the lowest along with wind and hydroelectric so climate change it is the only way we can go ahead nuclear power is the only low carbon technology that is now available today that has the potential to be deployed on a wide scale and in large capacities to help meet the global climate energy challenge so more and more nuclear power has to be you know uh, resorted to in order to uh, tackle and in order to mitigate the consequences of the climate change then again coming to the water side this releases from the nuclear power stations do not pollute the water bodies they preserve and help improve the habitat for plant life and also the wildlife they provide safe haven for marine life and no harmful pollutants in the cooling waters that is discharged from the reactors they meet clean water act requirements and they meet the limits on temperature and mineral content so absolutely no load on the aquatic systems which is surrounding the nuclear power stations so these are the factors which are uh, favoring nuclear power they will help mitigate the uh, climate change and they could account for 15 percentage uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction by the year 2050 and other issues are the increasing fossil fuel prices the depletion of the fossil fuels reliability of the supply sources now we have ample uranium resources all over the world we have access to the international market and also we have started uh, local uh, as we have started exploring the local uh, resources which are uh, available in india and also we have free access and the international access to the uranium market and uranium as a fuel cost it's a small fraction of uh, nuclear electricity so it prevents local and regional air pollution so lowest external cost in terms of damage to human health and environment so these are all the factors which are favoring the nuclear power so nuclear power is a sustainable source of energy they provide a national pride in the improve the living standards contributes to a national economic development the spin offs from nuclear power technology are also uh, very uh, good for uh, the benefits of uh, human as well as they create job opportunities around the nuclear power stations it supports local communities located nearby the plant to become most developed villages and contribute to the environmental protection and this slide was uh, shown maybe in the last uh, presentation also it was shown this is the three stage program of uh, uh, india so first stage we concentrate on the thermal reactors uh, phwr which is based on the natural uranium then the fuel which is reprocessed will go to the second stage of the breeder reactors which will be fueled 
using uh, plutonium use uh, thorium blankets will be used and the fissile material again uranium 233 which is obtained will be used in the third stage of the uranium 233 fuel reactors again where the thorium again will be utilized for breeding so that the, uh, ultimately we will have an energy security for 500 years this is the uh, estimation here and uh, second stage uh, 30 years and third stage when you start using the thorium reserves which is widely present in india so 500 years energy security uh, can be assured this is the vision of uh, uh, indian nuclear power program and this is uh, phwr program of uh, india which is the main stay of uh, india we can say and it was started very modestly in the year 1970s in rajasthan ravatbata site and then uh, the indigenization process was start was done in the 80s went on to standardization in the 80s then consolidation then commercialization in the 2000s where uh, many 220 megawatt standard uh, uh, units were constructed and commissioned then it was scaled up to 540 megawatt in tarapur now further scaled up to 700 megawatt electrical at, at kakrapara 3 4 and rajasthan 7 8 further and strategies for long term energy security this is the projected requirement so we can see here a deficit of 412 gigawatt we have a deficit here of 412 gigawatt uh, electrical here the additionalities like lwrs the lwr imports like kudangulam and other sites and other the fast builder reactors will literally wipe out the deficit in the year 2050 the deficit from 410 gigawatt reduced down to around 7 gigawatt electrical in the year 2050 by the additionalities and the second stage programs now what are the concerns about nuclear power so we have all now discussed about why we should go nuclear and why we should embrace the nuclear power but then there are several concerns about the nuclear power in the public side what are they one is the radiation concern people always uh, say uh, about uh, radiation then we have the nuclear safety whether the reactors are safe or not then we have the environmental safety is it safe to the environment or whether it harms the environment then ecological safety whether it is uh, safe for the flora and fauna biota waste disposals then we have the proliferation concerns military purposes as well as the electricity peaceful purposes then public uh, consultations now coming to the first one first concern radiation radiation is a part of life it is uh, an inescapable part of life wherever we go we have to face radiation radiation is a part of part and parcel of our life we get radiation from sun outer space the radioactive materials present in the earth house we live the food we eat the air we breathe the buildings where we live from all sources we get radioactivity so radiation is omnipresent it is present everywhere so it is there in the food you eat it is there and some radioisotopes are even present inside our body like some potassium 40 of uh, uh, potassium uh, element the potassium is a very essential nutrient for our body functions whereas potassium is having one radioactive cousin potassium 40 which is radioactive similarly carbon 14 polonium 210 some radionuclides are there which is present inside our body also which are naturally present and the main concern for uh, this uh, radiation is this we cannot see we cannot feel and we cannot taste and this is the major concern that is why the fear of uh, unknown is playing in the public mind this, there are different types of sources the population exposure comes from different sources like natural sources and man-made sources natural sources again there are two types one is the external exposure the other one is the internal exposure the external exposure comes from cosmic rays and terrestrial radiation the internal exposure comes from radon, thoron, cosmogenic nucleates, and singly occurring naturally present radionuclides and series nucleates like uranium series, thorium series, and all that. Then we have the among the man-made sources, the bulk of the radiation we get from the medical applications of the radiation, like occupational uh, medical exposure and diagnostic, therapeutic, then nuclear activities, nuclear fuel cycle, nuclear tests, nuclear accidents which have happened in the past, similarly, the nuclear tests which were conducted in the past. Then miscellaneous applications like industry, consumer products, research, air travel, which also incurs uh, good uh, radiation, uh, cosmic radiation dose. Then technologically, technologically enhanced 
natural radiation fuel cycle all these things constitute radiation dose to human beings and on an average all human beings are subject to this radiation dose this 2.4 millisievert per year millisievert is a unit of radiation dose and 2.4 millisievert per dose is available and wherever the person lives on an average a person gets 2.4 millisievert natural dose wherever he goes he will get this dose and among man made sources as i mentioned already we get around 0.6 millisievert per year due to the applications of radiation in medical like x rays diagnostic purposes therapeutic uses and all that so if you uh, compare the percentage of uh, radiation which we get from the releases where people should be concerned it's only 0.1 percentage whereas the 85 percentage radiation is coming from the natural sources and again 14.2 percentage is coming from medical radiation and 0.6 percentage from past fallout and all that then 0.45 percentage is for the occupational exposure only 0.1 percentage dose are the radiation people get from the power industry nuclear power industry and this is the radioactivity which is around us you take air fresh water sea water milk fruits vegetables even human body as i mentioned cereals pulses top soil wood brick all these items have quite a good amount of naturally present radioactivity and this is the natural background radiation in various cities mumbai kolkata delhi chennai bangalore and all that now if you shift from mumbai to kolkata you get 216 microgray which is additional radiation dose because in mumbai we have only 484 whereas if you move to delhi it becomes 700 so 216 microgray more we get this is 10 times more than the dose that you get from a nuclear power plant so this is the natural radiation dose whereas by living near a nuclear power station for one year you will get a very very le least amount of radiation dose whereas by moving from one city to next city you get 10 times the dose what you get from a nuclear power station by living there for one year and these are certain naturally high background radiation areas around the world we have certain places in uh, brazil china and also we have the kerala coast like uh, karnagapalli chavra where we have the monocyte sand where the dose is much higher than a normal background radiation area suppose the normal background is uh, around 2.4 uh, millisievert the people get around 10 to 15 uh, millisievert per year whereas the normal background area this is only 2.4 millisievert or maybe 2 to 3 uh, millisievert per year but people in the high background radiation area are leading a very comfortable and very healthy lifestyle and there is no problem whatsoever to the people living in the high background radiation area this is the radiation background at different uh, states of uh, uh, india we can see around 800 is the national average here 800 microsievert this is uh, the average uh, radiation or dose uh, at uh, different states now coming to this uh, dose from exposure to various radiation sources you can see here the nuclear fuel cycle gives a dose of around 0.1 to 0.2 microsievert per year whereas the total background radiation itself is 2400 microsievert and ingestion from ingestion from food and water is 290 microsievert the red on gives a dose of around 1260 microsievert in a year and also the a uh, coal plant stack also releases due to the concentration of uh, concentration of the uh, coal that is being used and also the fly ash that is being released and gas plant stack releases coal plant stack releases all these things release some amount of uh, radiation these are the average annual doses from practices in 2008 and global average doses from accidents they are all very less fukushima chernobyl nuclear test fallout they are also listed here and this is uh, electricity gener the, the collective dose from different electricity generation like coal fired power coal fired power plants then oil power plant peat fired power plant natural gas power plant geothermal plants nuclear power plants you can see the coal fired power plants also contribute to some radiation dose it's not only the nuclear power plant whereas other plants also contribute to some type of uh, dose because of uh, this technologically enhanced radiation 
materials. Now, the, as I mentioned earlier, high background radiation area, the average dose is 10 to 15 millisievert per year, whereas the average dose is only 2.4. In a radiation worker working in a nuclear power plant gets an average dose of only 0.4 millisievert per year, whereas the dose limit authorized by AERB or approved by AERB for a worker working in a nuclear power plant is 20 millisievert per year. So here we have a safe margin of around 50 here. Similarly, for members of the public, if we consider the average dose to the public from operation of a nuclear facility or a nuclear power plant is 0.05 to 0.1 microsievert per year, whereas the allowed dose limit by the regulator, Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, is 1,000 microsievert per year. Here we have a safe margin of around 20,000. And eating one banana gives you a dose of 0.1 microsievert. Now, that is another thing. This is called banana equivalent dose, one BED. Eating one banana will give you 1.1 microsievert, whereas this dose you will not get by living in the vicinity of a nuclear power plant for one year. Now, coming to the reactor safety, the reactor safety philosophy is based on the control of uh, radioactivity, the confinement of radioactive material, and also the cooling of radioactive material. These three Cs have to be controlled. Control of radioactivity, confinement of radioactive material, and cooling of radioactive material. This control of radioactivity is achieved by fast-acting safe shutdown devices. Similarly, the confinement of radioactive material is achieved to maintain the barrier to limit the radioactive releases to the public. There are multiple barriers. The radioactivity, just like that, cannot escape to the environment. There are multiple barriers, which we'll see in the next slide. Similarly, the a residual heat has to be constantly removed from the fuel by cooling of the radioactive material. If these three Cs are ensured, a reactor is always stable. The reactor safety is further assured by stringent quality standards, stringent international codes and standards. Seismic qualification is carried out by analysis and testing. Environmental qualification is carried out and probabilistic safety assessment studies are carried out to assure the reactor safety and fail-safe operation and safety system are assured, then online testing without affecting operation. All these types of stringent quality criteria are carried out before assuring, before starting a reactor. The basic principles of ensuring safety, then we, we can see that is a safe design, then we have the safe operation, contingency measures. Safe design is ensured by a proven technology, by adopting defense in depth approaches, and also by assuring good quality materials. Then safe operation is ensured by qualified and trained operators. This all our uh, nuclear engineers, they are just like, you know, these uh, pilots. They will be undergoing this refresher training. They, they have a simulator. They have to undergo this type of training every now and then. And they will be relicensed. Re -licensed. They have the proven operating procedures and operating experience feedback is always discussed and shared. And safety culture is nurtured. Contingency measures for all the safety systems and for all the systems, we have the engineered safety measures and engineered safety features. Then emergency operating procedures are in place to take care of any deviations. Then each nuclear power plant has got a robust emergency preparedness plan to address any and even eventuality in case if it is required. Then defense in depth is also assured by several barriers. One is the multiple barriers, which we'll discuss. Then reliable process systems, reliable safety systems, then computer operating and maintenance staff, then detect and correct failure, like STAR, stop, act, think, and review. That approach is always used to ensure that defense in depth approaches. Then assumption for defense in depth takes care of a probable error in the design, probable equipment failure, and also the possible human error. All these things are addressed in the probabilistic safety assessment and defense in depth approaches. Now, the concept of defense in depth. So here we have multiple barriers are provided to prevent any leakage of radioactivity to the atmosphere and ensure the safety of the plant personnel, the public and the environment. So we have the fuel pellet, which is encapsulated in a clad then we have the primary heat transport system or called the primary coolant boundary. Then we have a primary containment steel lined structure, which is uh, uh, there. Then we have a secondary containment. So radioactivity, which is there here, cannot just like that come, come out to the environment. 
and zoning concept is also followed around the nuclear power station they have a buffer zone of 1.6 km they call it as an exclusion zone where no habitation is permitted it is under the exclusive uh, control of uh, uh, the operator and we have a low population zone called a sterilized zone where 5 km more influx and migration of population is not allowed so these two things are also ensured as an abundant caution in safety assessment principles as we discussed already the radiation workers are allowed a dose limit of 20 millisievert whereas the basic safety objective is to control it at around 1 millisievert coming to the public the 1 millisievert is the authorized limit it's the approved limit by the regulator airb whereas the dose objective is to control it at around 0.0 to is 20 microsievert whereas for a modern plant like kudangulam it's around 0.1 microsievert which is having a margin of around 20000 now this is another thing which you can see the life threatening dose if you uh, imagine as the height of an, uh, an eiffel tower suppose if, this, if you consider this as the life threatening dose the dose what the worker in a nuclear power plant gets is the height of uh, you know 2 to 3 meters and the public whatever public dose is there it's almost the size of a brick now at each uh, nuclear power station we have uh, an environmental survey laboratory which takes care of uh, the environmental surveillance aspects and uh, these laboratories are uh, set up much before the plant uh, goes into operation so they start with the pre operational and baseline studies and they go on to do the operational monitoring afterwards so these uh, laboratories are there at every nuclear power plant and baseline data are collected demographic survey health status all these things are compiled during the pre operational phase itself so they take uh, the radioactivity measurements in air water food stuff and all that and during the operational phase the assessment of radiation dose received by the members of the public due to npp operations is uh, carried out to demonstrate the compliance of the effective dose received by population assessment of the radiological impact of npp operation on the local environment is continuously carried out and the radionuclide distribution and concentration in different uh, environmental matrices also profiled constantly these are the different uh, samples which are normally collected analyzed and monitored for uh, any uh, build up of radioactivity or any contamination aquatic site we monitor water sediment weed uh, uh, sea foods and terrestrial side air fallout soil grass milk land crops meat thyroid water all these things are sampled and the radioactivity is constantly watched and monitored and if any deviation is there immediately the operator is informed and corrective actions are taken so just a state of the art uh, instrumentation for uh, radiation measurement for in a environmental survey laboratory is a hyper pure germanium detector you can see we have, we have the detector is inside we keep the sample inside and it is uh, enclosed or it is uh, put in a very 12 cm thick lead castle to uh, prevent all this uh, extraneous uh, radiation so that we can get the signals from the sample without any uh, noise signal from the backgrounds so environmental impact we can say it is almost uh, negligible from a nuclear power station So almost the releases are zero and also the environmental impact is just 0.07 to 1.1 percentage of the natural background radiation so they pose no threat to workers no threat to the public no threat to the society no deaths have ever resulted from radiation in a nuclear power plant no significant radiation releases have ever taken place by contrast accidents injuries illnesses and deaths related to other energy sources are much common so nuclear power is uh, safe no radiation hazards and generation cost is uh, competitive no impact on the environment these are the uh, positives coming out from uh, nuclear then coming to the ecological safety the water is used for cooling in npp and discharged back to the sea they use the condenser coolant water this is common for all types of plants like coal oil gas and nuclear it's not that only nuclear is uh, using this water released from the nuclear power plant is only slightly warm and it well below the limit prescribed by the moefcc 
and it should be around it should be less than 7 degrees centigrade the scientific studies by seven universities in collaboration with board of research in nuclear science has found that water discharge from npp does not affect fish or other aquatic marine life the operation of npp over several years has shown that there is bountiful fish catch as always so here vibrant uh, fish activities and fishing activity going on uh, in the vicinity of the nuclear power stations and in kudangulam we have gone one step further we have a unique uh, fish protection facility uh, is provided in the intake water structure this facility takes care of the juvenile fishes which drift along with the flow of cooling water and uh, they uh, help them move away from the intake structures by not getting trapped in the machinery the fish are helped in getting back to the sea water and they don't get to the intake water lines and this is a very unique facility which is uh, uh, accommodated in uh, kudangulam design this is the marine life protection what we see here is the uh, kaizen structure and here we have the intake water structure where a screen mesh screen is uh, put and also a air bubble curtain is available which drifts the fishes away to the sea water and they help the fishes back to the sea so there is no fish trap in the machinery then at all the nuclear power station we have a very robust environment stewardship program this is a very voluntary initiative by the nuclear power stations it's beyond the regulatory and statutory scope and fulfillment they try to achieve the biodiversity and habitat conservation they train the local volunteers sensitize the public on local environment the exclusion zone which is under the exclusive control of the operator is used for green building and landscaping so this becomes a very clean green and tranquil uh, uh, environment hosting uh, water bodies and the gamut of uh, plant and wildlife so 1.6 km zone is preserved in its uh, pristine form it's located near water bodies like sea river lakes etc it's a home to a variety of uh, birds and uh, rare species in collaboration with the ngos and local naturalists surveys are conducted for census and natural nature awareness tie up with uh, bombay natural history society and indian bird conservation network in arranging workshops and training all these things are taken up as a, a proactive environmental measure to support the environment camp and over 5000 bird varieties have been spotted in the wetlands around the uh, nuclear power plants and they will be potential sites in the future for ecotourism and the pest free green landscape for butterflies moths insects and birds we have butterfly gardens around tarapur and kakrapar then we have the plantations of different species in these zones to attract various uh, life forms so these are some of the photographs uh, taken uh, around kudangulam it's a long view of the these are some of the winged visitors like uh, you know these are threatened nearly threatened birds which come to the uh, plant area the wood sand pipe these are some of the uh, birds which have come near uh, kudangulam so this we have taken a photograph and uh, to go one step further we have a nature club but all the nuclear power stations for example in kudangulam we have a pelican nature club it is uh, named after or it is uh, maintained after uh, uh, threatened bird so at kalpakam we have uh, a stork nature club at uh, narora we have a skimmer nature club so it is uh, you know a particular uh, bird variety which is threatened is taken care and special care is taken to support then let us come to the next issue which is the waste uh, management this is a waste management and disposal issues so storage technologies are now very sound and storage uh, options and the technologies are now available to treat waste as safe as possible and as mentioned in the last uh, presentation we follow in india a new a close to nuclear fuel cycle so whatever fuel comes out that goes for reprocessing so it doesn't go as a waste so the fuel gets uh, reprocessed and only the after reprocessing whatever fissile materials are uh, taken away the high level waste which is very low and manageable volume is processed as per the requirement and so it's a myth that uh, it's an uh, it's an insoluble waste management is an insoluble problem uh, but of all the energy forms if you see nuclear yields the least and most manageable easily manageable waste waste in fuel preparation and plant operation suppose if we compare this nuclear offers the 
least waste in fuel preparation and plant operation along with uh, solar. And so this, I have, I have already mentioned this, we are following a closed fuel cycle. Spent fuel is reprocessed and valuable fissile materials are recovered. And this, uh, this is a different categorization of the waste. We have very low level waste, we have low level waste, we have intermediate low level waste, we have high level waste. So depending upon the half-life and the activity content, they are categorized. And for each category, we have different types of uh, management solutions, like uh, low-level waste will go for near-surface disposals. The, some of the low, very low-level waste will be for landfill disposals. And only the high-level waste, which is uh, uh, of uh, little concern, will be treated properly. They will be going for some treatments like vitrification and all that. And they only will merit some long-term storage and uh, deep geological disposal type of uh, things. And if you look at the constituents of spent nuclear fuel, we can see 99.1 percentage is again uranium and plutonium. Only we have a 0.5 percentage is again fission products, cesium, strontium. Here, the cesium is again uh, a very useful radionuclide in agriculture, industry, medicine, and all that. They are recovered, and stable or short-lived fission products are of no concern. So only the uh, high-level base, which is uh, you know very very least in quantity, have to be properly managed and treated. Suppose if we compare a coal-based plant and a nuclear plant, we can see the waste comparison. The high-level waste for a 1,000 megawatt electrical nuclear plant is only 0 0.074 tons per day. Whereas in case of a coal-based power plant, you can see the so many tons per day of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, toxic metals, ashes, all those things are missing and they are not, always, they are not there in the nuclear power plant. So nuclear power plant, a 1000 megawatt plant, the 27 tons of spent fuel or three cubic meters after processing and vitrification. This is the least uh, which can be easily stored and uh, uh, stored in the uh, campus where the nuclear power plants are uh, located. Then the proliferation concerns. People mix up these military uses as well as the uh, the peaceful applications of uh, electricity generation. Here, there is a myth that nuclear re reactors breed weapons. A, it has got a very little foundation because when Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened, there were no reactors in operation. And the first few countries which built nuclear bombs did so before moving to electricity generation to nuclear power. So it is not an intermediate step. Electricity generation is not required for this uh, for making these uh, bombs. This program is separate and the other program is different. So nuclear power sector is only for peaceful applications of nuclear energy. And this uh, radiation finds applications in other sectors as well, like, you know, in uh, radiation of the foodstuff, where we can extend the uh, shelf life and also the pathogenic bacteria and the other uh, harmful pathogens can be killed and shelf life can be extended. Uh, this food and waterborne diarrheal disease are estimated to kill roughly 2.2 million people annually, of which 1.9 are children. So irradiating this food can help keep the quality by destroying these uh, pathogenic organisms. And it can be applied to a variety of foods, from spices and seasonings to fruits and vegetables. It's, it's almost similar to pasteurization, what we do for milk, but the temperature that is there for the other one is not uh, there for this. And they also find applications in removing 95% of sulfur dioxide and 70% of nitrogen oxides from the flue gases. This electron beam uh, technology, which is emerging, they can uh, help remove this type of uh, other oxides of sulfur and nitrogen, and the resulting uh, residue can be a good uh, fertilizer for applications in agriculture. Then we all know how this uh, radiation finds applications in cancer care therapeutics and uh, diagnostic uh, areas. Then finally, coming to the public uh, acceptance, this is the most uh, challenging uh, uh, part. Though we do everything, now we have to keep the uh, public on board. So public has to be consulted at each stage now, especially now uh, nuclear power plant is being expanded in a very big, uh, large uh, manner. We are going to have fleet type uh, uh, nuclear power plants at uh, different uh, uh, sites. So everywhere we have to do the environmental clearance and public consultation has to be carried out. 
and convincing public is a real uh, challenge and it's also an art so probably uh, dr malhotra saab might be uh, may, uh, must be agreeing with me it's a real challenge as well as an art to uh, take the public on board so but uh, now in all power stations and also in dae we have a very robust and very vigorous uh, public awareness programs where we try to reach out to the public and uh, also we try to convince them we uh, try to answer to their uh, misgivings needs then there is a community development program there is also a neighborhood welfare program which is taking place then there is a corporate social responsibility schemes the uh, the operator and the organizations are doing lot of uh, uh, beneficial uh, schemes they are uh, implementing several schemes for the neighborhood as a corporate social responsibility so we hope all these things will uh, become positives for us in the near future to help expand nuclear power in a big way thank you thank you very much